Today, uh, we are going to talk about stress as it relates to your health. And my name is Gretchen Wheelock, and I'm a nurse practitioner, and I work for the Whirling Thunder uh, Diabetes Clinic Program. And we are in the lower level of the hospital at 12 clans, and we specifically um, are seeing patients with prediabetes, um, are interested in diabetes checkups, and um, patients that have diabetes. We have a whole team of people included a registered dietitian, case management, certified diabetes educators, um, many more uh, nutritionists, um, many more people who are all on our team. So we appreciate the time to be able to talk to everybody and to have you guys here today to talk about stress and how this is gonna relate to your health. Okay, so the presentation objective. So we are going to define stress and identify the symptoms of stress. We're gonna determine how stress can affect your life and just within the routine of life. Identify the link between stress and diabetes along with other health conditions. We're gonna learn um, stress coping mechanisms and techniques. And then we're actually gonna practice a little meditation, gratitude, and some positive mantras throughout this presentation to take a few tools and tips home with you today. All right, so let's first take a meditation moment. So I'm actually um, not only just a nurse practitioner, but I am certified in uh, yoga as well. And so one of the things that I really love to do is yoga practice, which part of yoga practice includes meditation. So for those of you that are able to participate in this meditation, we're just going to do a little bit of a, a midday unwind um, meditation that I hope that you can enjoy. I know that sometimes it's easy to keep working and, and to just listen. But if you can give yourself these five minutes, I promise you, it'll be worth it to you. It'll be worth it to your body and your mind um, at that time. So if you can just kind of put your feet down against the floor, bring your sits bones equally on your chair, bring your shoulders over your hips and just kind of rotate those shoulders back and down the back. And then find a comfortable position for your hands. So we oftentimes say in yoga that if you're in need of more grounding and more centering, that you can bring your palms down towards your lap. And then if you're in need of more light and just letting go, that is when you bring your palms up. So the back of your hands are against your lap. And then if you feel comfortable in your surroundings, I really invite you to close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, start to focus just on your breathing and your breath. And so what I want you to do is notice as you breathe in just through your nose, and allow that chest to expand and allow the breath to go all the way down into your lungs. See, visualize that breath filling up your lungs. And then as you exhale, visualize those lungs kind of shrinking and all that air then coming up and out of your nostrils again. Continue to just breathe like this as you inhale, allowing the lungs to be filled with oxygenated air. And then exhale, release. And sometimes we tell our yogis or the people who are participating in this breathing exercise to focus on the point in between their eyebrows and we call that the third eye region. So if you can focus on the third eye region as you inhale through your nose, filling up your lungs, that air is filling up and focus on that third eye region as you exhale, allowing that air to go back through the nostrils. 
And sometimes the mind begins to wander, especially if you're in a season of busyness and having a lot to do, but acknowledge that mind wandering and then come back again to your breath because as you focus on that third eye region and you focus on the inhales and the exhales, you might also notice that things are starting to slow down a little bit. Maybe your breath is not as rapid as it was when we first started this meditation. Maybe your heart rate has slowed down just a little bit. You feel calmer and more relaxed here, sitting in a normal spot in your office or at home. Begin to relax your eyebrows in the frowned, maybe furrow brow. And if your tongue is pressed up against your mouth, can you relax the tongue, relax the jaw? And just let it go. Relax the neck. Allow the shoulders to just fall heavy down the back. Your arms become heavy and limp taking all the muscle strength out of your arms so that they're just hanging there on your lap. Relaxing the fingers, each finger, the thumbs, the pointer finger, the middle finger, the ring finger, and the pinky. Allowing the breath to continue to slow as you breathe inhales and exhales. The chest becomes heavy. Your stomach loosens. Your hips sink into the chair. Relax your bottom and your buttocks. Allow the thigh muscles to relax, your knees to relax. Your calf becomes heavy. Your feet are still. And as you draw attention down into your feet, you notice that ground and that earth below you that is supporting you, holding you. And bringing gratitude for this earth. In this moment that you exist here in space. And being grateful for just these few moments for yourself. And this little bit of relaxation will follow you throughout your day as you interact with people around you. Taking another deep breath in through your nose. And exhale. And when you're ready, just bringing a little movement into your fingertips and your toes. And then roll those shoulders again. Maybe you can go the opposite direction that you went when we first started the meditation. And then you can open up your eyes when you feel ready.
So that little meditation was less than 10 minutes. I actually didn't record it. Um, I didn't see how long it was, but just thinking about how much better that just those 10 minutes felt and how easy while you were following the sound of my voice, you can find those same meditations on YouTube. You could talk yourself through a meditation, just a head to toe scan and just appreciating what a few moments of silence and breathing and focus can do, because that is absolutely one of the things that you can do for yourself when you are in a stressful situation. So what is stress? So when we think about stress, it is how your body and your mind, notice I like to circle body and mind, how that's reacting to a new or a difficult situation. So we can all throw out a difficult situation such as maybe your kids have gotten sick and you have to get to work or you had something big planned for the holidays. Uh, your car breaks down, you might have friction with your boss and some of these stresses are conscious and some of the stresses are unconscious stresses. But what we do know is that stress is unavoidable. unavoidable. And so we can plan and shift and, and have the type A personality to try to avoid every single kind of stress possible. But the, but the reality is, is that we all have stress. Everybody has stress. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, and it's essentially unavoidable. But what we do with the stresses that come into our life is what's the most important thing. Now, stress can be caused by everyday events or it can be changes in life which may, may create stress. And so sometimes we, we talk about situational stress. So that's a situation has happened, we just need to work through that stress and then really the stress can go away. But sometimes people have stress that is everyday stress and that's it's, it's unavoidable stress that they're having a very hard time getting away from and maybe they can't control that stress. And that's when we start to get a little bit nervous and worried because chronic stress is when we can start seeing health changes. So with stress, any normal stress um, can cause this hormone uh, hormones to be released. And with that increases our blood pressure, it can increase our heart rate, it can make our breathing go a little bit faster. It can also increase our blood sugars, which is one of the reasons why we're talking about this presentation here today, you might feel nervous, shaky, anxious, and then definitely have some gastric side effects. And so we'll go into these a little bit uh, more in depth. Um, and, but it's important to remember that, you know, stress cannot, can affect our body, our physical body, but it also can affect our emotional and our mental health. And so that's really important for us to keep in mind, because sometimes we're always just worried about our physical health and not always worried about our mental and emotional health. And it's, it's also important to remember that not all stress is bad. So let's say, you know, we always talk about the fight or flight mode. And let's say that we were, um, you know, in a, in a car accident or we were, we were in a, a situation where there was a bad guy and we're trying to get away from the bad guy. That is a stress. And what our body does to that stress is it improves our functioning at that moment in time to get out of that stressful situation. I also teach at Briarcliff University. And so a lot of my students will say, oh, I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. I'm stressed. And I say, you know, it's not always a bad thing when you're feeling a little stressed and, and you're nervous because it's telling me that you're taking your studies or, or whatever it is you're stressed or worried about very seriously. And that you take your, you, you worried about the outcome because it matters. It's important to you. And so there's another example of not all stress is bad stress. So in the short term, we have the, the nervous system that it will address, adjust to our stresses. And with that, you might notice that you're more alert. And um, in this situation, like you might end up having 
you know, some people before they go into a big race or, or into a presentation, they might have, they might have to go to the restroom and their, cause their, their stomach is just really agitated. Um, our, our heart rate will, will um, increase. We might get a little sweaty at times, but that is all the normal response from the nervous system. So we don't want to look at that as being a bad thing, unless if it becomes an, an everyday thing or a chronic thing. Um, so with that also then some of these short-term side effects, if they continue all of these fight or flight symptoms and it becomes more of a chronic disease state. And so with long-term symptoms, if you think about your body is always tensed up and anxious, that's gonna cause a lot of extra pain and stress aches in the shoulder. Sometimes your shoulders are, are crunched up like like so, sometimes um, you'll have back aches, just you're not gonna sleep well at night. When you don't sleep well at night, um, it really becomes a situation where you might become more stressed because you're not sleeping well, your immune system will become weaker. Um, some people will get chronic headaches from chronic stress. Um, we typically, when, when we get chronic stress, we start doing things that maybe we wouldn't always do all the time to deal with our stress, to unwind, to ease the stress. And so we, I, we think about the, the unhealthy behaviors that could come from long-term signs and symptoms of stress, which could include, you know, drinking alcohol, um, smoking, uh, gambling our stress away, overeating. That I would say overeating is probably what I do, uh, probably the most when I'm feeling stressed and I just think that, you know, eating is going to make, make everything kind of go away. Um, we might be um, compulsive with shopping. Um, so really kind of all those unhealthy behaviors might be a result of some of these long-term stress side effects. Um, one of the other things that I uh, mentioned is that uh, with the ten muscle tension, you can have the jaw that's constantly clenched. And so that can also then cause a stress headache. Um, and a lot of times people will clench their jaws during the day and they're unaware of it, but then also at night, like with teeth grinding. And so then that can cause some complications down the road. Um, trouble with having sex. So if you think about having, um, you know, a relaxed, um, you know, you're tired, you're maybe you're more tired, um, you're, you could have an inability to, to enjoy or relax, that can be a problem. And then also your weakened immune system. So the more stress we have in our lives, the weaker our immune system is. And so with a weak immune system, that means that might be that maybe we're getting colds more often. Maybe we become more susceptible to the flu Maybe we, you know, and all these things just keep piling on one another um, to the point where we end up having chronic stress. And some of the results of chronic stress include anxiety, they can include depression, panic attacks, sadness, heart disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes. So when we think about, okay, well, how how can, how can stress lead to these things? Well, it's from the overeating. It's from not taking time for ourselves. It's from eating bad food choices, which could then lead to the heart disease. Um, overeating in the sugary sweets, the desserts, the carbohydrates. Those are sort of things along with, you know, sometimes when we're stressed, we think, oh, I just want to sit here and I don't want to do anything else because um, I'm fried. And so we're not, instead of being physically active or, or exercising, we are sitting and just surfing the internet or we're looking um, at TV or we're looking at social media. And while these things might seem like your way or my way of dealing with stress, it can perhaps cause more of these symptoms, such as the depression or the anxiety, especially if we start to compare 
what someone else is doing on social media and what I'm doing or how they might look happy in how I'm at home stressed and, and how I'm dealing with that. So another thing I just kind of wanted to mention was the effects of stress over here on the left-hand side. This was actually a visual that I found while um, getting this presentation ready. And I thought it was pretty great. Um, it, it includes quite a few more things than what I have mentioned in, in um, my lists here, but really thinking about you know how uh, chronic stress and the effects of stress can affect even your hair, which is pretty crazy to think about. It can cause mouth ulcers or dryness in your mouth. Um, we'd already talked about the cardiovascular disease link. Um, people that have asthma, if for some, or COPD, if for some reason this anxiety or these panic attacks kind of come in with the stress, that can really affect how we're breathing. Um, with our brain, the stress can trigger insomnia. Um, we already kind of talked a little bit about the muscle spasms, but the GI tract can be one way or the other. It can, you can have constipation or diarrhea. And with a lot of stress, we can start seeing ulcers in the system. So we could see it in our esophagus. We could see ulcers in our stomach, or we can see ulcers even further down in the GI tract. So where's the link to stress and diabetes? Well, we know that diabetes is actually an endocrine um, disease. And so with this, we think about hormones with the endocrine system. And so what happens is, is when you're in a stressful situation, whether that be situational distress or chronic stress, your body is releasing cortisol and adrenaline. And if you think about, you know, you say, oh, I've been running on adrenaline, you know, but when your adrenaline and your cortisol levels are so high and that energy is so high and you're in the fight or flight mode, your body starts to become tired and fatigued. And when you're tired and fatigued, you have less ability to cope and less ability to maintain that body's homeostasis. So when these, when these hormones are floating in high amounts in our body, in our system, it makes it much harder for insulin, which is natural in our body's system to work properly. And so that's when it, when we have coined this term insulin resistance. And so if your blood sugars are high, there's just not enough insulin in our bodies naturally to bring those blood sugars down. And as you continue to have high blood sugars, then that's when we start seeing the effects of prediabetes and diabetes. So if the stress is chronic stress, that's when there might be higher links in higher blood sugars. And so this is actually a question that we ask all of our patients that come in. If their hemoglobin A1C, which is a 90 day uh, measurement of their average blood sugars, we will say, you know, if it's high, we'll say, okay, here's an entire list of things that can make your blood sugars go up. Can you identify any one of these or several of these that might be contributing to higher blood sugars? And oftentimes our patients can, can point to several different things. And I would say more often than not, a lot of the times, the things that they're pointing to is the stress, the higher levels of stress. And either it may be related to their workplace, it could be related to their home life. So, and then we go into, okay, is this situational or is this a chronic stress? Is there anything that you can do about this stress? So I do want to mention that stress alone does not cause diabetes. But there is, a, there is a big link between increased stress, chronic stress, and risks for type 2 diabetes. And it's mostly because of those hormone levels and then what we do to combat the stress, which is oftentimes not the best behaviors um, and unhealthy behaviors, such as overeating, under-exercising, and then continuing to allow that stress to just kind of keep happening in our lives.
All right, so how to cope with stress. So with this, we think about exercise. So exercise when you feel um, symptoms of stress coming on and even like just going out and taking a quick walk either around your building or if you can go up and down the stairs, taking a two minute break for yourself. If you can get outside, that actually improves your mood even more so than if you were walking inside. We oftentimes say that even if you're like getting tired and sitting at your desk, every 30 minutes you should be moving around. So if you have to get up to go to the printer, get up to go to the bathroom, instead of sitting for more than 30 minutes, get up and move around. So at the end of each day, if you can take a minute to think about what you've accomplished, like, all right, like maybe I didn't get everything done that I wanted to accomplish, which how, how often does that happen to all of us, right? But you did get this done, this done, this done, or maybe you didn't get anything done on your schedule, but someone else came into your office and you were able to assist them. So thinking about outside the box of if you didn't get to your to-do list, what did you get to? Another great thing is setting goals for your day, making your to-do list, like put the most important things at the top, and then the things that you can get to later down at, towards the bottom and keep, you know, checking those things off your list. And so one thing is, is that we need to think about, you know, if you, if you think about just narrowly what you can control, it's let's, let's get to our to-do list. Let's look at our daily, weekly, monthly, monthly goals. And then consider th- talking to a therapist or a healthcare provider about your worries if you're stressed. Um, I think that that's, that's it for that slide. Okay, so strategies to reduce your stress. So when I think about these strategies, we, are, we already did that meditation. Uh, yoga is a great way to breathe, move the body. Tai Chi is a slow and methodical way of moving. I know some of these classes are offered at Whirling Thunder here in Winnebago. Uh, As far as movement, just breathing, exercising, and some muscle relaxation. You also want to eat right and exercise and making sure that your body is um, sleeping. If you're not sleeping and allowing yourself that seven to nine hours of sleep a night, your body continues to just really create more and more stress throughout the day. Um, One thing we need to have is that homeostasis between eating right, getting movement into our bodies, and then sleeping. And then that's what's going to improve our immune system, boost our immune system, so that when diseases or, or illnesses or viruses come our way, that our body can recognize those and, and shed those instead of, you know, perhaps even get sicker and sicker. So staying positive and practicing gratitude, we'll do just a little bit of this at the very end of this presentation. And we want to make sure that you're acknowledging the good parts of your day and life. So sometimes, in, in, and perhaps this is you, but I feel like we all can think about somebody that we always call like a Debbie Downer, right? They're always focused more on the negative things and the things that everyone's doing wrong, as opposed to what, what actually did happen today? What, and, and one of the things when I, when we get to sit down as a family and talk, um, we typically will say at dinner time, we'll say, okay, um, tell us one thing that you're grateful for. Tell us one thing that could have gone better today. And one thing that went really, really well today. And so instead of saying, think of a next, think of something that didn't go well, well, think of something that could have gone better. (laughs) And even just changing that, that mindset and that, that frame um, with my own kids has been kind of nice because it's, you know, we're acknowledging that maybe we could have made a better choice or 
things could have gone a little bit better. And sometimes we have control of that and sometimes we don't have control. And so that's this next one is accepting that you cannot control everything. And I oftentimes will have trouble with this one for sure. And that finding ways to let go of worry and worrying about a situation that you cannot change. So I always think about when I know that my kids are traveling or my husband is traveling or they're away from me and I always get worried about the weather and I get worried about all these different things. And then I, I come back to the, the focus of me worrying is not going to help that situation at all because I'm not there and I'm, I cannot control that situation. And so that is definitely something that I then just hand over uh, to God or creator and, and, and let him handle what I cannot control and let, it, let that worry dissolve and go away. And then learning to say no. So this is really hard for a lot of us. And I feel like I have gotten a lot better in this, in this modality, in this preventative stress strategy. But one of the things that I recommend uh, to you is don't, don't feel bad saying no uh, when somebody has asked you to do something. Now, we all have our work responsibilities where we're voluntold to, to do things and it's job related. And those aren't the things that I'm necessarily talking about. I'm talking about the things that are the extracurricular, the things that you don't have to be doing. And so if you can think about what is life giving to you and what is life draining. So when somebody asks me to do something or asks me to be on a committee or asks me to help out with this event or that event or whatever it might be, I oftentimes think about, is this aligning with what what I'm passionate about? Is this something that I'm excited about? Is this something that I have the energy to give to someone else? Or is this something that I'm going to say yes to today and then regret a week or two later? And that, oh, I just don't want to do this. So is it life draining? So if you can think about if that can help you align your yeses and your no's, to be completely honest with you, there have when I'm when I'm honest to people about saying, you know, I really wish that I could do that, but I just I'm I'm really trying to say no to more things lately because I want I don't want to be in the life of hustle and I don't want to be busy all the time and I don't want to be stressed and so I'm I'm just really sorry, but I'm going to have to say no to that. It's really amazing to see how people respond to that because most everybody says, wow. I'm really, I mean, I'm really impressed by your ability to, to say no and to not just always say yes because you feel bad saying no. So practicing saying no in little things in your life, especially the things that don't align with your time, your energy, and your passions. And then stay connected with people who keep you calm, make you happy, and provide emotional support and help with you with practical things. This is another thing that I think we all have uh, somewhat control over. And so they typically say that you become most like the five people you spend the most amount of time with. So if you think about the five people you're with the most in life, if you think about what they look like, what their behaviors are like, are they happy? Are they sad? Are they nervous? Are they anxious? Or do they have healthy eating habits, exercising habits? What is it about them that, that, that wants you to be around them more? And so we are all adults and thankfully, um, most of the time we get to choose who we want to spend our time with and who we want to be around. And I oftentimes say that be around people that will continue to lift you higher and that's not a that's not a selfish mode because in in and in return you're doing the same things back to them right and so instead of living in this constant life of competition or living in this life of of feeling like you have to do better than the other person or that we're all cutthroat and, and out to get one another where can we stand in being in 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 a group where we're feeling supported. And when we do have um, a situational stress, how can we use the five people that we're around the most 
to help calm us, to help um, maybe ease the burden, to take off the load. Um, and so really thinking about that too. And we get, we have choices. We get to pick our friends. We don't always get to pick our coworkers, but we oftentimes get to pick our jobs. Um, so where is it that you need to make changes and, and where is it that you can decide not to be with somebody who is life draining, who's always negative and who, who's interested in bringing you down with them? Cause you don't want to be around those people either. So seeking help with stress. So stress is not measurable with any sort of test, but we can measure blood pressure. We can measure heart rate. We can measure depression. We can measure anxiety, but it's important to know that only the person feeling that stress can determine if stress is present or not. We cannot say that, um, that you're stressed. You have to say that. So it's very subjective. Um, so if you're feeling chronic stress, if you know that this is not just a situational stress that you know you can, you know, get through and just plan ahead and, and, and do what you need to do, that's when seeing a healthcare provider like myself or another healthcare provider, such as a mental health counselor, can really be great in easing that feeling of being overwhelmed talk through some strategies, similarly to some of the strategies that we've talked to, to talked about today. And then if for some reason you ever feel uh, like you're really turning towards drugs or alcohol for coping, these are un, unhealthy coping mechanisms uh, that we really don't want anyone to have in our lives. And, and certainly if you have any thoughts of hurting yourself or others, you need to seek medical uh, attention uh, immediately. So we mentioned a little bit about the link between diabetes, higher blood sugars, um, and chronic stress. But what some people may have never heard of before is this term called diabetes distress. And diabetes distress, distress actually happens to quite a few people that have diabetes. Um, it, what it is, is, is an actual emotional response to those burdens of living with diabetes, because we know that when somebody has diabetes, they have to check, usually have to check their blood sugars. They might have to take medications. They, um, maybe there's more of an emphasis on dieting and exercising and, and different medical appointments here and there. And so that can become very burdensome to an individual. And then that's when there's this feeling of discouragement and worry and frustration. And sometimes people will literally just stop checking their blood sugars because they know their blood sugars are high and they don't want to see high numbers because that makes them feel worse. Um, they might, it might lead to uh, more unhealthy habits. They might even skip um, coming to appointments because they know their blood sugars are high and they don't want to have to hear one more time about how their blood sugars are high and all the things that they should be doing instead of what, are the, what, what they're currently doing. So diabetes distress can look like depression or anxiety, but it's, it is different from depression and anxiety. Typically what we do to help treat and to help cope with diabetes distress is very similar to what we would do for depression or anxiety as far as let's talk through this. Let's talk about how we can change our mindset and our frame of mind and how can we talk um, to a mental health professional about the stresses of diabetes because they're real. Um, other things that can help in the short term are are creating a calendar, setting up um, a, a journal or a reflective journal of what you've eaten, what your blood sugars are, if you've taken your medications, talking to a diabetes educator. Sometimes the, the things that patients with diabetes are distressed about are simple fixed things that we can say, oh, well, if, if, you're, if you're missing your nighttime medications and that's really making you feel bad because your blood sugars are higher, then let's, let's, let's change that. Let's change the time frame that you can take your medications. Or if checking your blood sugars four times a day is too much, 
maybe you would qualify for a continuous glucose monitor, or perhaps you can just check your blood sugars once a day. Like we can really adjust and change things as needed for diabetes. So there is um, a, uh, an educational site, it's the Diabetes Educational Services that just actually came out with these 12 reframes of dealing with diabetes, burnout and distress. And, you know, I'm doing this presentation during the holidays, which I think is when most people are distressed because they have a lot of extra things on their plate and um, people are getting more time off and, and because of the holidays and maybe they have to get more work done um, at work on the days that they're there. They have to be buying presents or, or you have to bring things to parties. And so there is a little more stress in the holidays, not only with coping with perhaps family members or um, maybe there's an ongoing sadness from a loss of somebody who's not at, the, at your holidays. And these are all very, very real. And so what I wanted to do is just kind of walk through and talk through these 12 um, steps here. So I put the website down um, for the diabetes distress. Let's see if I can get this open here. Okay, so I'm gonna share a different screen here really quick. And a couple of our patients have really enjoyed this handout. And so if you, if you know somebody who you think maybe is going through some diabetes, burnout and distress, please share this uh, link or this page with them. Um, it's really helped quite a few of our patients in thinking and reframing what you're dealing with. So I'm just gonna talk through some of these. It's not your fault that you have diabetes and it's not your fault that your pancreas doesn't work right. You can't control your blood sugars all the time but you can take actions to manage your diabetes to the best of your ability. Blood sugars are not good or bad. They're just numbers and that they help inform us of what actions we need to take next. So listen to your self-talk. It is tempting to be overly self-critical and to blame others but try to imagine that you are coaching a friend that has diabetes. So what advice or coaching would you provide to them? Diabetes isn't about, isn't about being perfect and getting it right all the time. It takes baby steps to make small improvements and to keep safe. So take short mental health breaks with your diabetes, walk outside, enjoy a hobby, listen to your music, volunteer, join a support group. Talk about your feelings with friends and family. Let them know what to help, what help, what helped you to succeed and think that, and don't think that you don't need help. So keep active, nourish your body, try meditation, enjoy oxygen cocktails and get out in nature. Remind yourself of all the work you are doing as opposed to aren't doing with your diabetes. Join diabetes camps, social groups, find other people, especially people in your own community that also have diabetes and find out what they're doing. Consider connecting with mental health professionals or the diabetes team. And then remember that you are not alone, that you are resilient, and that you are not your blood sugars. It takes baby steps and you've got this. So those are all really great positive reinforcement things 
for people that do have diabetes that I'd hope that you can share either with yourself or with somebody that you know um, in keeping them positive and making sure that they're caring for their diabetes in a way that is uh, a positive way of caring for diabetes. All right, and so our, for our final slide, it's another little working slide. So a lot of you, I think, are probably um, at your office desk or perhaps you're um, in, in, at your work um, or um, maybe even at home. But if you had a piece of paper or you can get your phones out and go to the notes section, I just um, wanted you to think about three things that you could identify today that you are grateful for in your life. Just three things. They can be big. They can be small. Thinking about these three things, writing these three things down. And then once you've done that, some of you maybe got to write three things down immediately and you could have written 20 things down. I really encourage you to do this every day if possible and do this on days in particular that you're feeling down, defeated, stressed, because a lot of times when we're feeling down, defeated and distressed, where we, our minds start to turn to the negative. And so what these things that you're thankful for, even if you've had the worst day, <laughs> maybe your car is broken down, your kids are sick, your refrigerator stopped working, um, somebody showed up unannounced and, and they had their own stresses in life. There's always something to be grateful for. There's always something to be grateful for. And if we can reframe our gratitude and identify those things every day, it'll, it'll help decrease the stress and make us think, okay, this isn't so bad. All right. Yep. This is a stress. Everybody has stress. How are we going to deal with this stress to keep kind of moving forward and then create a positive mantra that you can always fall back on regularly. So one of the, one of the positive, a positive mantra is saying something like I am blank. And instead of thinking of something negative, you want to think of something positive. So I am light. I am happy. I am not stressed. I am whatever I am loved. I am accepted, whatever it might be. And so the positive mantra that I tend to always go back to is I am light, I am light. And so however that might mean, is it that, that my light is always shining super bright? No, it doesn't mean that, but it sure means that I want, I want to be one of those people that everyone maybe would, would prefer to be around as opposed to the person that no one wants to be around. And sometimes, you know, my happiness or my energy or my light might be a little too bright for some people. And I, I understand that. And I appreciate that. And, and I'm okay with that. Um, but that's where we get to choose, right? And you get to choose those people that you want to be around and who, who you gravitate towards. And then just like we uh, created, or we did the meditation this at the very beginning of this presentation, how can you do those two minutes of meditation or two minutes of prayer, either before you get started on your day, at the end of your day, or maybe even in the middle of your day when things are starting to feel a little bit out of control and out of your hands? How can you hand that over and pray and meditate uh, for a positive outcome? So these are three things that you can easily do within one or two minutes of your day uh, to decrease your stress. And, and hopefully uh, some of you are able to follow through with these. And that would be the end of our presentation. Um, and for the most part, um, the things that I pulled are, are from this presentation came from the Center for Disease Control 
the Cleveland Clinic um, about stress, and then also from that diabetes education website, which I also just pulled up as well. <clears throat> 